Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well and welcome to another bonus. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click the like button. It takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's bonus, shall we? Tonight's first encounter. Hello, y'all. This is my experience at Glendale Tuberculosis Hospital. Probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Before y'all think about going and exploring, get permission first. This place is heavily monitored and patrolled. You have better things to spend your hard-earned money on, other than trespassing fines. On to the experience. My name is Amanda, and this is the time we went to the asylum. It was a warm summer night, and myself and Mike were sitting around doing what dumb teenagers do, trying to talk to ghosts, while Sally was playing Farmville on her laptop. I will never understand those weird games. We got bored very fast with our lack of evidence and decided that we wanted more. After all, we were at Sally's haunted apartment building. Mike was a tall guy. He was 20 at the time. He had dark hair with a buzz cut. He was into the paranormal, and I was a little put off by it, since I had a life-altering experience at the age of 13 with a terrifying cryptid, but that's another story for another time. We used Sally's laptop and started to look up haunted places. We didn't want places people told us could be haunted, and we didn't want places that were overrun with tourists. It was summer, after all. Then, after about 45 minutes of searching, the idea was all but dead, but then I came across an abandoned asylum. Hey guys, come here and check this out, I said. Now, with the excitement in my voice, Sally was rushing over with me and Mike to see what we found. I looked at Sally with a half-cocked grin and said, we have to go, echoed by Mike. Sally was the one with the car. Mike ended up driving. Sally agreed with a quick gathering of supplies, water bottles, lighter flashlight, and granola bars. We were out the door and piled into the car. It was about 8 p.m. as we pulled out of the parking lot of her giant apartment building. Upon arriving, we pulled up behind an already parked Saturn Ion. There was not a parking lot, but more like a pull-off, and we only found it by pure luck. There were, and still are, posted no trespassing signs everywhere along the road. I looked at Sally, and she saw I am now instantly regretting my decision. A small hint of panic flickered in my eyes as Mike smacks me on the shoulder and says, Let's go, you bunch of ninnies. Also adding, looking directly at me with a teasing tone, You know, for being a macho lesbian, you sure seem scared of the dark. I stuck out my tongue and flicked him in the ear. I grabbed our survival bag, and we all got out of the car. It was eerily quiet, around 10 p.m. when we stepped over the guardrail. Preparing to make our journey through the woods when two men came running out of the woods looking ghost white. Neither of them said a word to us. They ran to their car and drove off like a bat out of hell. Sally looked at me and whispered, I know you're still not considering going into that place. I looked back and uttered, let's go. Mike followed, with Sally reluctantly close behind. Each one of us had a flashlight lighting the path in front of us. 
I started to hear the faint noises of babies crying in the distance, but quickly pushed it to the back of my mind, saying it was just my imagination. We all come upon a wide creek with the deepest part, maybe three feet. As we start to cross, Mike reaches his long arm across to stop us in our tracks. He panicked and whispered, Did you see that? Turning our flashlights off, we wait and try to see what he stopped us for. Then we see it. In the distance are tiny balls of blue lights hovering through the trees. We all hold as still as possible as the ice waters graze our ankles and our shoes are fully submerged under the water. We at first think they are flashlights of maybe possible security guards on duty, but the more we watched, we realized at the distance the flashlights would have been, had to have been 20 feet in the air. I'm trying to understand what I'm seeing in front of us. I'm speechless and judging by the looks of everyone else's face, they are too. And just as quick as they appeared, the lights disappeared. It was truly a strange event. After five minutes of standing and wondering what we saw, I snapped out of it. We never found any evidence of anything there. And that was the only time we saw those blue balls of light on the journey, so we pressed on to the original destination. As we came upon the building, it looked ancient, as if nobody had been there in decades. It was huge. Guys, it was the size and had the looks of a decent-sized hospital. We all were in a kind of awe. When we came out of the tree line, we walked right to the side entrance that wasn't locked shut. Instead, it had chains over the doors with padlocks. We all could easily slip inside. Sally went in first. I followed, then Mike. It was pitch black other than our kind of awful flashlights. The air was heavy with the smell of old leaves, rust, and spray paint. Most likely from someone just wanting to put a piece of themselves into history. We entered on the first floor and explored for a good hour. On the first floor, we found an old gauze tape, medical scissors, old puzzles, beds with straps on them. One of the nurses' stations had a few old records of patients once housed there. It was really creepy. We came upon a staircase and used it to get to the second floor. Immediately, everything changed. The air was suffocating. It became rancid with stagnant water. Mixed with rot and decay, and a feeling of being watched loomed over us. We were walking all quiet when Mike yelled at the top of his lungs, I'm not scared of you. I almost jumped out of my pants because the tension and the feeling of suspense was heavy in the air. Sally, all the while suffering from what she calls a mini-stroke. I hit him in the arm and Sally did the same, screaming inaudible words. We walked down the hallway a bit and again I hear a faint baby cry. I quickly turned toward the room on my right with my light illuminating the space before me. It was a dark room. It was almost as if the light of my flashlight was fighting to stay lit in the darkness. Mike and Sally take two steps toward the door in front of me. As we are staring, Mike jerked his head to the left and froze. In that instant, I was shoved so violently from behind I almost lost my balance falling forward into the dark space in front of me. As I throw my left foot in front of me to try to regain my balance, I look up to a huge metal door being shot millimeters in front of my face. Not only did I feel the force of the wind, I heard the window break further down the hall. It had to be related. It was instantaneous. I snapped back and fell on my butt. Instead of falling forward, my palms were met with a sharp pain. I had fallen on glass, and now my palm was bleeding everywhere. I ripped a piece of my shirt off and quickly wrapped it up around my palm, applying pressure. I dropped my flashlight, and I'm sure it's still in the building today. Sally reached down and picked me up, and we all booked it out of there. I was confused as why we were running out of there, because I was under the impression Mike had pushed me, and was still trying to figure out how the door had shut. Running outside, I yelled, Stop! I was not only out of breath, but I wanted answers. In three big, heavy heaves of air, I utter, Mike, why did? And three more big heaves of breath, you push me. Mike looked at me in sheer, te sheer terror, and so did Sally. Sally blurted out before Mike could say anything, Amanda, 
Neither me nor Mike pushed you, we swear. And I knew at that point we needed to leave because I had just realized that I was assaulted by an unseen force. Now we start to run faster through the woods and we hit the creek. The sounds of babies crying hit us again, except this time closer. I'm peeing my pants in terror at this point. Sally is a good five yards ahead of me, and Mike is on my heels. I plummet to my knees as I trip over a rock I couldn't see in front of me, since I had dropped my flashlight in the asylum. I hear Mike run up and reach down and grab me. He pulled me up to my feet in one quick jerk, and we continued running. Now, not only is my hand torn up, my knees are covered in scuffs and small cuts. I'm soaking wet. I literally look like someone out of a horror movie, blood and dirt everywhere. We reach the other end of the creek, and the baby crying stops, and we don't hear it again the rest of the way back. We stop a few yards after leaving the creek and catch our breath. All of us looked at each other, just as confused and shook up as the last two guys we saw. Mike spoke first. Guys, I don't know what happened back there. I mean, I saw what happened, but I can't explain it. I looked at him as he stared at my hand and then back at my knees. I smiled and looked at both of them and simply spoke two words. Lesson learned. We all nodded and Sally broke the following silence with, Amanda, your hand is really bleeding bad. So she threw her arm around my neck and we all walked back to the car trying to lighten the mood with small talk and macho big talk just to make our broken egos feel better. As we reach the edge of the wood line, we are greeted with a pair of red and blue flashing lights and an officer who could retire any day looking at us with a furrowed brow. He said, I suppose that was y'all back there making all that ruckus. I looked up at him with tears in my eyes at that point and said, please, we just want to go home. We've had a hard enough night already. The officer looked at his watch. The time was closing in at 2.30 in the morning. And he looked back at me and asked me my name and if I needed medical assistance. I assured him I was fine and just wanted to go home for some rest. He then handed me a fine in the amount of $1,500 for trespassing. Before entering his vehicle, he looked over straight at me and eerily said, Now I won't be seeing you all around here again, will I? We all shook our heads and finally were on our trip back home. None of us really talked about that night ever again, but I'll tell you what, I sure think about it often. Me, Sally, and Mike all went our separate ways shortly after that. I always wanted to ask Mike what he heard that night, right when I was getting pushed. Sally said she heard a little girl call him Papa, but I never know what was really heard. I live in Northeast Ohio. I had gotten a new job about two months ago as a process technician at a dairy plant. It pays pretty good money considering it's a 34 to 35 mile drive one way. After 20 to 25 miles, I drive through a wooded area. Nothing uncommon for me as where I live in Northeast Ohio, forests are common. And I pretty much lived in the one behind my grandparents' house growing up. I work 4 p.m. to 4 a.m., and the drive home sucks, whether it's being tired, hungry, or the fog almost every night. I go the same way every day and night. I was driving my way home. I had just left the residential area of my workplace, and I was going through a forested area. As I said, there's almost fog every night, so I'm on high alert for deer, raccoon, and other such critters. It's just like every other drive home so far. I have a podcast on, focusing on the road, thinking of getting either a sausage McMuffin or a McGriddle from McDonald's, and sometimes looking off the side of the road for any eyes reflecting off my headlights. All of a sudden, I see some reflecting eyes. Out of the woods comes a coyote. In my hometown, coyotes are not too rare. I've seen them in my high school but I had never seen one outside of my hometown, so I was surprised. I start slowing down as it crosses the road until it turns to my car and sits in the middle of the road. It sat about 10 feet from my car. There had been no cars I had seen since leaving that residential area, so I was going to go around it, 
but I thought this is too odd of a thing to happen to just drive away from it. I expected it to just get up and walk away at any given second. This is where I began to get very scared. I honked my horn and after two or three seconds it smiles at me. I have my brights on so I can see it perfectly. This coyote had human-shaped teeth. My heart dropped and every hair on my body stood on end. Just as it is now recounting this incident, it lasted about a second before sitting up and running into the woods. I sat there in fear for about five seconds before shoving my foot on the pedal and driving at getaway speed. I didn't stop and get food because I had and still have no appetite. I thought the rest of the ride home what I saw, once doubting I had seen it, but like I said, with my brights on and it as close to my car as it was, I saw it as clear as day. This coyote had human teeth, and there was no doubt about it. I'm very into the paranormal, and that includes cryptids. Is it possible that I ran into some genetically mutated coyote? Or, I don't know, a shapeshifter? I am part Native American, if that counts for anything. It's so weird typing this out, but I'd like someone who knows more about this to help me. Tonight's third experience. This encounter took place three years ago at the time I was 17 years old when three of my friends and I had been staying in a cabin in the Great Smoky Mountains of North Carolina. We were celebrating the end of junior high of high school. It was just us four. The first night we got there, we heard some noises from outside the cabin and an occasional tapping on the windows at about one in the morning. I didn't want to look outside to see what it was. My friends said they couldn't see anything, so I looked out, but I couldn't see anything either. Next morning, we went outside and saw some footprints around the cabin and into the woods. There were footprints I've never seen before. Kind of long, narrow, with obvious claw marks on four toes. Fast forward to the night we decide to go outside and build a campfire. We're all joking around, laughing, having fun, when we heard a growl from the woods. The shrubbery and smaller plants around us start to move, like swaying in the wind, even though there is no wind. I look behind me and instantly notice two amber-colored eyes staring at us. I turn to my friend to ask if he's seen them as well. He looks at me pale in the face and asks, WTF is that thing? I tell myself that I don't know what it is, but it seems to be massive and I do not want to find out. So we started to run towards the cabin and yell to the others what we saw. They immediately run with us and we are in the cabin. They don't believe us and believe that we are trying to prank them. After a few moments, they looked outside and it was standing about 30 feet from the cabin and caught a quick glimpse. The creature was bipedal, about nine foot tall, grayish black hair, very muscular, with these massive claws and huge fangs. We closed the blinds and tried to forget about a thing, but we were obviously terrified. Later that night, I went to bed and I looked out the window. The creature was in the same area, now staring directly at me. I thought about trying to take a photo, but I truly didn't want to upset this thing. Needless to say, I didn't get any sleep that night. Hoping daylight would soon come, the next day we packed up and left, not wanting to spend another night in those woods. None of us even mentioned the incident among ourselves. This is the first time I've told anyone about this because... I didn't think anyone would believe what I saw. The thought of that creature staring into my eyes from my bedroom window still haunts me. Tonight's fourth experience. The year was 2010 and there was going to be a blood moon. I rounded up a bunch of equipment to get a good picture of it. I love the moon. My favorite times have all happened under its pale light. Borrowed an awesome camera that could be attached to a telescope, had my laptop and various other equipment, but also strapped on my forty cal pistol, because there are mountain lions and coyotes in the area, northwest Arizona. 
loaded all my gear into my jeep and headed to the area, a few miles away from town. I get to a place where I'm going to set up, begin unloading and setting everything up, and I hear some nearby sheep starting to freak out. I didn't think much of it. And after a handful of moments, they went quiet again. Just as I was unloading the scope, I heard a very loud splash, and for some reason this caught my attention. I stood up and looked toward the creek for a second, but I didn't hear anything else. So I went back to setting up the telescope. Now I hear some rustling, twig snapping, that sort of thing, and stand up and shine my flashlight around to see what I can see. I do not see anything, and whatever it was went quiet when I shined the light around. I figured I had scared it off and started to screw with the scope onto the tripod when I heard a very loud snap and whipped back around. While pulling my gun and shining my light towards the fallen tree, I had noticed earlier. But there it was, roughly the size of a bear. The head was more canine than ursid, and the body was more lean. We stood there staring at each other for what felt like an eternity. Then it growled and charged. I screamed and fired my gun repeatedly. After the fact, I found I had fired eight shots. It bowled me over, and I fully expected that my life was over, but instead of the following through with the attack, it just kept running, disappearing into the cornfield. Thoroughly spooked, I tossed the most expensive bits I had unpacked back into the jeep and left immediately. Only going back once the sun finally came up to finish collecting the gear. When I got there, I found a game warden and a couple sheriff's deputies and the farmer that owned the field slash pasture. Apparently, whatever it was had killed a couple of sheep and they were trying to figure out what it was and where it went. The tracks were both canine and also not canine. They were strangely longer than the standard dog print. What was it? Well, I'm still not sure, and sometimes it still keeps me up at night. Some have suggested that it was a dog man, but I'm not sure I believe in such a thing. All right, guys, another just simply terrifying bonus upload. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I really do appreciate all of your support. Your support is honestly what makes this channel continue to grow and go and what makes it special. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, our pets, our family, and friends. These creatures are real, they are out there, and they are dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions. Never stop searching for answers, and God bless.